Okay, well, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Rhonda Fisher, and I am the clinical program lead for team training at the AHA. And welcome to our July webinar on enhancing collaboration, leveraging team steps for non-clinical success. So we try and make it a priority to let the people that we come into contact with at AHA Team Training know that Team Steps isn't just for the clinical environment. In fact, embedding Team Steps into non-clinical situations and processes, we really consider it essential for long-term sustainability for both clinicians and non-clinicians. So today I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Jen Braun. She's the director of AHA Team Training at the American Hospital Association. Jen has her master's in public health, is non-clinical by background, and absolutely excels at the application of team steps in the non-clinical environment. So it's going to be a fantastic uh, webinar today. But before I hand it off to our speaker, I'm going to go over some rules of engagement and just a few announcements. You can access audio by listening in through your computer speakers or through your phone. If you're having issues, you should be able to access the toolbar at the bottom to switch to either phone audio or computer audio. Please note that you are in listen-only mode throughout the presentation today. I will moderate a Q&A session at the end with our speaker, so if you have any questions, please chat them in throughout the presentation. If it's technical or logistical in nature, we'll answer that in the moment, but if it's for our speaker, we'll save it for the end. And finally, please note that this presentation is being recorded and we will notify all registrants when the recording is up on our website. So we're also happy to offer free CEs for our webinars. In order to claim your CE credit, you must create a Duke One Link account, however. This is a one-time only setup and my colleague Kara has chatted in those instructions for you. Uh, you can also refer to the email that was sent to you this morning uh, with the attachment. So following the webinar today, you're going to want to text those big red letters, G-A-N-M-U-N, -N, to the number that you see on the screen. And don't worry if you don't get all of that right now. We'll share it at the end as well. Do want to let you know about a couple of upcoming team training events. So we have a couple of in-person Team Steps Master Training courses coming up. One right away, uh, July 15th and 16th at Northwell Health in New Hyde Park, <laughs> tough words, New Hyde Park, um, New York. Um, they've been a pioneer in the Team Steps movement across the nation. So that's going to be a fantastic course. And also September 25th and 26th, we'll have an in-person course at Houston Methodist in Houston, Texas. And we do have a virtual offering that will be happening this fall um, with our partners at the University of Washington. That will be September 19th through November 7th. You can access more information and registration links on the slide itself. And we want to highly encourage that you attend with a small team so that you can work with that team and really walk away with a strategical and tactical plan for your team steps implementation. Now, if you're looking for a more customized training solution, we do offer on-site trainings where we uh, at AHA come to your organization to deliver anything from a two-day team steps master training course to a comprehensive training program that spans multiple on-site trainings and virtual coaching, to truly support your Team Steps implementation efforts to foster both ownership and sustainability at your organization. Um, we love the custom trainings because they allow us to customize our content to your audience, um, to meet you and your hospital or health system right where you are. Um, you can visit our website to learn more and complete a brief questionnaire where one of our team members, likely myself, will follow up with you one-on-one -on -one to get started on a solution that's tailored for you and your organization. So with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to today's presenter, Jen Braun. Thanks, Rhonda, appreciate that. Hi, everyone. 
My name is Jen Braun. Um, you may recognize me from participating on some of these webinars in the past, but I'm here today to talk about how team steps can be used outside of direct patient care, um, whether it is in a hospital or health system or just in an office setting. I feel very passionately that using it non-clinically really binds us all together no matter our clinical or non-clinical background. But a little bit about me is that um, I'm the director of the AHA team training program um, and have been a master trainer for about 11-ish years. And so I've worked with hundreds of clinical and non-clinical teams from across the country. So I'm looking forward today um, to share our strategy in training all members of the healthcare team. Um, the value of using team steps non-clinically outside of direct patient care. And I'll share some really specific tactical strategies on how to teach the tools non-clinically, in addition to some implementation um, and sustainability strategies. So this is going to be pretty practical and tactical, um, and we'll definitely be sharing all of the um, activities and tips um, as resources following this webinar. We'll show you how to access it. But just to level set, make sure we have a shared mental model here. Um, team steps, like everything else, is a, is a long acronym, team strategies and tools to enhance performance and patient safety. Uh, it is evidence-based from more than 30 years of research from other high-risk industries. So there's a lot of parallel parallels between nuclear power, the aviation industry, and military medical teams. And at its core, it's a teamwork and communication system aimed to improve not just patient safety, but team performance. And so we'll talk about the team here in a, mom in a moment, but it's centered around these four modules of communication, leading teams, mutual support, and situation monitoring. And so our mission and our philosophy at AHA Team Training is that everyone who works in healthcare is an expert in what you do. But it's not enough to be good at what you do if we're not good at what we do together. So that's why it's our mission to turn a, to excuse me turn a team of experts into an expert team where we're all function where we're all functioning at a high level from a team performance um, aspect to improve the work we do to improve the care we provide kind of whatever um, scenario you're in um, clinically or non clinically. And so when we think about the team, the structure of our teams have changed pretty dramatically, I'd say in the past few years. And so, especially nowadays, they can be in-person or virtual. You know, I know for my team, you know, we are uh, based in Chicago. Um, Rhonda is out based in, in Oregon. Um, so we spend a lot of time um, in virtual meetings on Zoom, on Microsoft Teams, and chat, and email. Um, and so the Teams, too, can be temporary or permanent. Uh, they can be frequently changing, um, especially due to different assignments or schedules, or if we think about um, in the healthcare space, all the travelers that come in and out, um, the new grads that come in. So um, our teams are constantly changing and evolving, and they essentially fall into these um, categories that are represented in the triangle. So when it comes to especially team steps training, I think, um, you know, we do a great job of reaching the core team. And so the core team is really that group of care providers who provide that direct patient care. Um, and then same with the contingency teams. So these teams are more time limited. Um, they're maybe formed for an emergent or maybe a specific event. So that could be um, your rapid response team, for instance. And so again, I think those in yellow, we do a great job of focusing on our team steps training and implementation, but there are some other key teams, um, team members that, um, are really part of, of the larger multi-team system for patient care. So think about the coordinating team. So those might be working, or those might be team members who are responsible for managing the operational environment that support the care team. So think of maybe your care coordinators or patient navigators. Um, they might be clinical in background, but they are doing a lot of 
non-clinical administrative work. Uh, when we think of our ancillary and support services, these provide, again, direct um, care or direct support that might be task specific or time limited. So um, think about lab or environmental services or social work. So talk about a very interprofessional group of, uh, of people that make up that kind of sub team. And then finally, when we think about um, our, our health system, um, we have those in administration. So these are the folks that are um, supporting and encouraging um, our teams, providing um, accountability, helping with performance, defining the culture. Um, and so there's a lot of different roles and responsibilities. And so I want you to just take a moment and think about what team do you fit into and chat that in right now. So the core team, contingency, coordinating, ancillary and support or administration. So think about that and feel free to chat that in. I'm just curious. So already some administration, a lot of administration on this call, support services, core team, great. And so for those, um, I'll now, I'll now ask, especially for those of you who have a clinical background and provide direct patient care, is there some administrative aspect of your job? So emails, meetings, I want you to reflect. Um, and in which case I would argue that team steps can be utilized in those areas as well. And like I said, that really binds us and um, kind of creates that baseline um, for the entire multi-team um, system for patient care, that we are all, no matter what we do, we are all, fortunately or unfortunately, on emails, going to meetings, dealing with administrative work. And that's where I really think that utilizing team steps um, non-clinically um, can really help bind us together, um, where we have that commonality in, the, in our job responsibilities. And therefore, we need to utilize a shared language in that space as well. So. Um, Ultimately, we just need to team better um, because when we're on the same page, we reach that what we refer to as a shared mental model. So despite your role, utilizing team steps can lead to more effective and concise communication. It can foster that mutual support and backup behaviors, provides a better shared understanding of the team's roles and responsibilities, um, understands and predicts next steps more efficiently, and overall just creates commonality for the team's purpose. So if you look at this list here, again, whether you're providing direct patient care or not, or doing more of the office or administrative work, all of this applies to the teams that you work uh, with. And so ultimately our approach to training um, is we always aim to teach to an interprofessional audience. So not only does that mean providers and nurses but those from other key teams that we identified um, in the multi-team care system. And so when we do train interprofessionally, we teach the clinical and non-clinical uses for each tool. And this has a couple of benefits as it helps, not, it helps the non-clinical staff connect to the bigger picture of the work that they're contributing to. Um, but it also helps the clinical staff reinforce the tools because again, despite being clinical, um, just like their non-clinical colleagues, they're still, again, going to meetings on email, which team sets tools can be reinforced and embedded into the culture for further um, success and sustainability. And so our philosophy also is we help course participants um, apply the tools they've learned through non-clinical um, simulations. So that way everyone is at kind of an equal level. And so you'll see in the photo here that we have an interprofessional team doing um, what's become beloved as our Lego simulation that comes from the University of Washington, where they're able to practice some of the tools they just learned um, with a, a simple Lego tower, or there's another one out there about paper chains. That's pretty classic. Um, and then we also incorporate non-healthcare videos into our content to help, again, drive the point home again, that the tools can be re relevant and relatable to anyone. 
So that's really just kind of our holistic approach to training. Um, but I'm gonna kind of take a, a quick pit stop here at the AHA. And so at the American Hospital Association, so we are working in an office environment, you know, non-clinical, non-patient care. Um, and so we saw the need to train some of our colleagues in team steps. And so prior to the pandemic, we did a bunch of two to four hour, what we call team steps essentials courses. Um, so abbreviated courses that really just focus on teaching the tool and applying the tool or tools um, for, uh, we worked with meetings and travel, finance, our data team. And then my team at AHA team training utilizes the tools as well. Um, we weren't necessarily a part of the trainings. We've kind of just adopted them as they are part of our lives and just part of how we function as a team and just do business. Um, but before we conducted the trainings, I just wanted to point out a few strategies we used. Um, so we utilized the Team Steps Teamwork Perceptions Questionnaire, uh, which I'll ask Kara to chat in here. Um, and so we slightly modified the questions to really fit the needs of our very non-clinical audience. So you'll see there that we have, you know, my, in the original TPQ, my supervisor or manager takes time to meet with staff to develop a plan for patient care, where we modified it to develop a plan for our work. Um, and then here's one about staff cautioning each other about potentially dangerous situations where we changed it to, um, they caution each other about unsuccessful outcomes. So, you know, or my team, my unit was changed to my team. So really subtle changes that doesn't really change the heart of the question that it's asking, but just some of the nomenclature. Um, and so we utilize this survey and we just changed it on our own, put it in a like Microsoft Forms or SurveyMonkey or whatever we used at the time. And we utilized it at baseline. And then again, at three and six months post course. And so um, just sharing with you here that this is the results from one of the work units we worked with. And so you can see the baseline is in blue, um, three month follow-up is in orange and the six month follow-up is in green. And you can see that we um, you know, made some improvements at three months but really were able to make more um, sustainable change within six months. So again, some of the questions we didn't have to change at all um, cause it still made sense. Um, like staff verbally verify information that they receive from one another. Um, my supervisor or manager provides opportunities to discuss our team's performance after an event. And so again, the, for those that aren't familiar with the TPQ, these are really great to be able to connect into certain team steps tools. So for this one here about discussing, um, the team's performance after an event, if this was low, which um, it wasn't, it was a little low, um, we could really focus on that tool in their training. And you can see that the increase there. So that's how we've used this specifically just for a non completely non-clinical group of folks um, where we just don't have the um, clinical flow in our, in our area. But I wanted to get a pulse check from you all here so I'll ask Kara to pull up the first uh, polling question. Um, so what does Team Steps training look like at your organization? So you might have clinical and non-clinical team members already training together. Maybe you just have clinical team members training together. Uh, some might just have discipline specific. So maybe just nurses only. Um, you might be unsure or you might not be doing any team steps training currently. If there's anything else that, you know, doesn't apply to you, feel free to chat that in um, just to know other scenarios, but just wanted to get a pulse on kind of where everyone's coming from. So I'll give everyone a second. Okay. So uh, thanks for sharing the results, Kara. So 
kind of all over the map. Um, it's great that about 30% of you are, are training your clinical and non-clinical team members together. Um, the next runner up is we're not doing team steps training currently. Uh, hopefully this presentation gives you um, a bit of a jump start, um, and we can certainly help support any anything that you might need or questions you might have following this if you're looking to learn more. Um, and then the next largest group is that about 23% of you are only training clinical team members together. So thanks. We're going to move on to the next question. There's um, two more. So does your organization, for those that are doing team steps training, does your organization teach all employees the importance of team steps for the non-clinical environment? So for those that are doing team steps training, do you incorporate the non-clinical perspective to all training participants? All right. Again, a pretty healthy split of, of yes, no, and unsure across all of them. So we have a pretty um, diverse audience here in terms of, um, of, of your needs. And then the last question that we are going to ask is really, what are you looking to get out of today's webinar? Um, are you looking for strategies for teaching team steps non-clinically? Um, ideas and strategies for implementing team steps outside of direct patient care, or perhaps something else. And if it is, please chat it in. And again, I'll try and do my best to address some of those here or later. Okay, so um, good news is I will be doing both. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to see where, where people were at. Yeah, I will be sharing some strategies for teaching it non-clinically and also um, how they can be used to further implement and sustain and propel some of the, your team steps work moving forward. So thanks for taking the time to answer that. Um, and so some of you or most of you might be familiar with um, the tools and strategies. Uh, this is from Team Steps 3.0. So for those that aren't familiar, there's been a couple of tools added. Um, not many. The core content of the tools haven't has not changed dramatically. So um, Teachback is now um, a specific tool. iPass has been replaced, or I'm sorry, the former handoff tool, which was iPass the Baton, which was insane. Um, has been replaced with iPass. So we're very happy about that. And then um, STAR was added. So uh, most of this has, has stayed the same, but with a, um, some addition of a couple tools. But what we feel like are really good big bang for your buck tools to apply to the non-clinical environment are the ones you see here. So I would say a majority of them can be translated to the non-clinical environment. And so for instance, when we, when I shared with you that we, you know, train just purely non-clinical folks at the AHA, these were the tools that we focused on. Um, and so for today, um, before I get into that, something that uh, I really like about this is it's a really helpful checklist when we think about teaching the tools. So this is our approach. So for every tool we teach, we think about, okay, we need to teach the tool again, no matter if people know it or not. So we'll take SBAR as, as an example. Um, we'll teach SBAR. We'll share an example of SBAR, whether that's like a story or a video, or just we'll put together kind of a script. Um, we'll provide the opportunity for participants to practice the tool, and then we'll give time for reflection. And so for the purposes of today, I'm gonna share um, how we provide examples or stories or videos um, non-clinically, as well as the opportunity to practice the tools for SBAR, closed loop communication, briefs, huddles, debriefs, and cuss. Um, if I was to whittle it down from the previous slide, 
to a bit more, I would say these are the biggest bang for your buck tools um, for really how non-clinically um, or how team sets tools can be used non-clinically. Again, whether someone is um, a clinician or not. And so we're going to jump right in. And so for instance, with SBAR, what we'll do in a course is we will share the clinical example. And so I think this is a pretty classic uh, example with um, uh, perhaps a nurse calling a provider about a patient. And so you can see, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see here that you know, Barb um, provides a situation, gives a little bit of background about the clinical context of why she's calling Dr. Smith, um, the assessment, so what she's, you know, seeing, hearing, um, observing, and then the recommendation. And so again, in our trainings, we'll also share the non-clinical use. So for me, this is an actual email I sent to someone and so um, this is the, you know, the non-clinical example of, and I will usually take a screenshot of the email just to really drive it home um, and put it in the slide. But uh, this is an email I sent to someone where it said, where I literally wrote situation, I'm passing along the three month follow-up results from your survey background. Your team filled this out at baseline before the course with 50 respondents and three months after the course with 46 respondents. The assessment is your scores were already extremely high at baseline, yet you improved in nearly every category at three months. Your average at baseline was 435 and 447 at three months. See the attached analysis, request, keep up the great work, and please distribute to your team. Um, so we like to provide, again, this cl non-clinical example because, again, whether you are an administrator or you are a physician, I guarantee you are sending emails. And so I usually will just say at a course, you know, my, my challenge to you is to send one SBAR email this week. And so once I kind of provide the examples, we do some practice. And so again, clinically, I think kind of the common facilitation tool here is you might get like a jumbled, um, you know, SBAR, or I'll refer to it as like a word vomit where you might just write out a bunch of, you know, scripting on, you know, someone just coming up to you and just spewing out a lot of information. And then you ask participants to put it in an S bar. What we've done um, to kind of practice this non-clinically is we utilize these non-healthcare related scenarios to practice. So I would assign a table or let participants choose one of the movies here. Um, and come up with an S bar. So it could be related to the plot or not, and they would just develop an S bar. So this is from the hangover. So this is a kind of a common one people will pick where, you know, the situation is he's lost his tooth. Uh, the background is he had a crazy night out and doesn't remember what happened. The assessment is um, he looks like he's in a lot of pain. And my recommendation is he should go see a dentist, right? And so that's how par participants, again, whether clinical or not, um, can practice using the SBAR tool um, through the use of something like this. And so I, if I didn't say it earlier, um, you'll have access to all of these um, activities and facilitation strategies, and I'll share where you can access that after this presentation. And then we talk about then finally, how can we spread and sustain team steps? outside of those clinical patient care situations. And so this is when, you know, I will share, again, I provided an email example, but for instance, um, SBAR can be used in proposals. So um, if you are requesting more staffing or a particular uh, resource, we've worked with organizations who they have to put it in an SBAR. Um, we ourselves have done SBAR presentations. So if we um, have quick report outs or quick presentations, we'll put it in an SBAR. So kind of what's the situation, uh, the background related to the project, um, instead of the assessment, we'll call it like the analysis and then recommendations and lessons learned. And so that's how we'll have sometimes people present out in the form of an SBAR. Um, but there's a lot of different ways uh, to use it. And so we like to highlight here 
Um, for those that are um, using this non-clinically, if there's anything else or any other ways that you use SBAR, feel free to chat them in um, and share with your colleagues on this call. And so moving on to, again, closed loop communication. So the next example. So again, we'll share the, you know, kind of classic clinical use of it um, via a conversation. So this is regarding a medication, but then we will also provide a non-clinical example. So here is, for instance, a Teams chat. So when we talk about our teams being virtual, um, this is a way closed loop communication um, can be used. So, you know, Barb sent a chat to Chris saying, can you update the fiscal year um, 2025 forecasted revenue, 200K and close the loop, oopsies, close the loop when you've shared with finance. Chris, sure thing, I'll update the fiscal year 2025 forecasted revenue, 200K and we'll circle back. Barb, yes, thanks. So we have the, you know, the request, we have the repeat back still over chat. It's not just okay. And then the confirmation. And then Chris continues to close the loop with the task completion saying, okay, it's been updated and I let finance know. But this is how we can use closed loop communication non-clinically. And it's really about the language. So Barb said, can you close the loop with me? And so again, it's utilizing the language just like SBAR can be utilized in the same way. So that again, when our clinical and non-clinical team members are working together, they have that shared language. So this is just an example we'll use across the board um, when working with our, with our teams. And so again, if we're looking for pr a practice opportunity in our team steps trainings, um, this is a great one. And so we will have them do a drawing activity. So we will have people pair up in partners. And so partner A has a picture printed out, like one of those kind of simple pictures of either a house or a car. And partner B will need to draw that picture. And so they'll essentially be back to back. Um, you could do this virtually um, and just have their cameras off or just have them not obviously show them the picture. Um, and so partner A obviously cannot show the picture to partner B and partner A can't see what partner B is drawing. So they have to use that closed loop communication to reach um, the, the, the same outcome. And so again, this is just a way to demonstrate it outside of um, um, a clinical scenario. Um, we've had teams or other faculty use the telephone activity where you basically break people up into two lines. You whisper a phrase and they have to pass it down the line um, and they have to send it down one by one. Um, and the phrase can only be whispered to each receiver once. So again, we're taking away the ability to do a repeat back or to use closed loop communication. So that really demonstrates the need for it, especially when it comes to just a simple phrase or something um, versus you know, what the outcomes could be if we, if we didn't use closed loop communication. So again, just another um, example of, of how to facilitate this. When it comes to then actually um, spreading and sustaining and putting this into practice, um, again, whether you're clinical or non-clinical, a great opportunity for doing this is in emails. Um, so, you know, I might say, would you mind, similar to the Teams chat example I just showed, would you mind closing the loop with me once this has been done? Or, hey, I'm checking in and uh, I haven't received a, a closed loop from you yet that this has been done, which again, sounds much better than, hey, have you heard, did you hear me or have you done this yet? Again, it's utilizing the language into our day-to-day -day workflows. Um, so asking for that loop to be closed. Um, something my team does is at the end of meetings, we do repeat backs. So we might have, and this is truly an agenda item on our weekly meeting or weekly briefing actually, and so at the end, we just report out the priorities and next steps that each of us own. And so that gives us an opportunity to make sure we're all on the same page or I'm like, oh, Kara, you forgot. Uh, remember, I need you to do X, Y, or Z. Or it's an opportunity for us to cross monitor one another and make sure that we are all on the same page and have a shared mental model leaving that meeting. And so 
again, this is just using that language um, in our, in our non-clinical world. Now, when it comes to brief huddles and debriefs, I think this is my favorite and biggest bang for the buck, because again, there's such a parallel in using this um, inside a hospital with patients and families versus, you know, in kind of our office setting. And so for briefs, huddles, and debriefs, again, we'll teach the tool, explain what it is, but then we'll provide the following examples or kind of use cases for it. So for instance, whether you're at a, we, we led a national conference, our team did. Um, or if you're thinking about doing like an EMR launch where it's like high, high paced, there's a lot going on each day, we would institute briefs, huddles, and debriefs. So for instance, we would brief every morning as a team at 7 a.m. about our conference, identify what was on the agenda, um, what speakers we needed to connect with, uh, any challenges we anticipated, so, you know, if anyone had questions, um, we would huddle as needed. And then we would debrief at the end of each day at 5.30. So we had a standing brief and a standing debrief for multiple days. So again, this could be similarly done inside a hospital, again, non-clinically with an EMR launch and utilizing the tools um, to help with something like that, where again, high paced, a lot going on, where you really need to make your teams, uh, sure to make your teams uh, be on the same page and have that shared mental model. The other type of example is, I mentioned that for us, we utilize these in our um, weekly team meetings. So we do a, um, a Monday briefing as a team. We huddle as needed. And then on Thursdays, we have a closing the loop meeting. And so that is our um, ability to, again, close the loop on some of our progress and tasks that we've identified on that Monday meeting. And also gives us a chance to um, debrief a bit. But I will say that when it comes to uh, doing it, briefing and debriefing, we do them regularly for webinars or presentations. So for instance, Kara, Rhonda, and I briefed before this webinar, and we will debrief after. <laughs> uh, we brief and debrief um, before leading Team Steps courses. When new projects kick off, we brief or debrief. Basically, everything we do, uh, it is expected and part of our culture to brief, huddle, and debrief. And so, again, from a um, hospital or healthcare system setting, you know, there are still instances where clinical and non-clinical folks are coming together regarding a project or regarding um, a new opportunity where these tools can still be utilized. And so it's just being able to call those out. And so the way we practice this, which again, I alluded to earlier, is that um, we have stolen the the Legos or the team training tower simulation from our friends at the University of Washington. And so the alternative is you could do a very similar activity with paper chains. And basically you do several rounds of these throughout your training and it helps build on the tools that you just taught your participants. And so again, we have resources to help facilitate this, but I think this is one of the best ways to help demonstrate a lot of the team steps tools, not just brief huddle and debrief. Um, and so this is how we like to really, if we were to just do specifically a couple of activities or simulations, we would really focus on this and prioritize this. And so when it comes to really some sustainment um, strategies to ensure that this is really ingrained into your environment and your culture is that no matter what, whether you're doing this clinically or non-clinically, we set the expectations at the beginning of each of these about what it entails. So again, hey guys, we're gonna brief really quick. We're gonna share um, what the plan is. Uh, we're gonna do some quick introductions, um, see if anyone has questions. Um, 
or for a debrief. Hey, we're going to talk about, we're just going to spend three minutes. We're going to talk about what went well, what could be improved and what's one thing we'll do different next time. So you can take the top of those briefs or huddles or debriefs and set the expectations. Again, similarly, no matter what, it's encouraging people to speak up. Um, when you talk about psychological safety, this is a great way, especially in a debrief, when you're talking about what went well to get people comfortable speaking up because it's much easier for me to go, hey, Carol, what do you think went well about this webinar? Or, hey, Rhonda, what do you think went well today about um, day three of our EMR launch? You know, if I'm asking what went well, that's much easier and less intimidating than going into um, like what could be improved or that just that comfortability and, and feeling that psychological safety of speaking up. So that's really how to like lay the foundation Again, whether you're using this um, inside or outside of direct patient care. And then a big one for these that, again, we, we, we share our strategies about ensuring that you have a process in place for um, communicating the information to anyone who cannot attend. So oftentimes, especially clinically, like after a code or... Um, you know, a vaginal delivery, when you, you know, you really intend to debrief, but people are moving on to the next thing. You know, we do have some parallels like that in our non-clinical settings as well. So at the, our national conference, for instance, it was hard to sometimes gather people for that 7 a.m. brief and 5.30 p.m. debrief. But what we would do is we would have a big flip chart um, board in our office, or if you're in a hospital setting, you might have a visual management board or some other um, existing means to communicate information. So we would um, brief and put our notes up there. Um, for those that couldn't come to the brief, we would ask them for any questions they had in advance and we would take a picture of it and send it to them after. Um, and same with the debrief, we would ask them if they weren't able to attend to, you know, enter their like what went well, what could be improved. We would add it to our debrief notes list. We would have the debrief and then we would chat in the picture to our WhatsApp group following it so that everyone who wasn't there could see the larger group's feedback. So again, having a process can definitely help make this sustainable. And so again, just like um, in the clinical environment, we always encourage folks to start briefs and debriefs after routine events and same thing um, in, in our world. So just because we do these webinars monthly or just because we do a lot of Team Steps Master Training courses, it certainly does not preclude us from briefing and debriefing. We find it vital. And again, it's just part of our culture. So by starting with something routine can help make it a bit easier and more efficient at first. And then finally, the last tool that we've kind of translated to the non-clinical environment is CUS. And so um, CUS is uh, uh, an ability to help stop the line when there's a patient safety concern. But when we've taught this to our AHA team members, so again, very much outside patient care, um, where you know no one is dying, there's no one terribly at risk. We've changed it to, I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, this is a success issue. And so I know with me and my team, we don't get past the word concerned because again, the having that shared language is so much part of our culture and it's been ingrained into us that it kind of just perks our ears up and we instantly stop what we're doing and we pay attention because it's just one of those trigger words. So the importance of the shared language is something we've trained um, some of our AHA colleagues in. And again, a way to practice it is we'll give them a simulation. So we'll give them a simulation that you're in the car with your teenager and um, they're just learning to drive and they pick up their phone because they got a text message or they answer a call. So how would you cuss them? Um, and so again, we'll use this in a clinical setting. So we will ask our clinical colleagues to come up with this cuss. And so again, just a way to kind of level set and baseline everyone. And so when we think about some of these spread and sustainability strategies, it's just using the language consistently or say at the end of a brief saying, hey, does anyone have any concerns about today or about this presentation? Um, and you, just using that ability to have folks speak up 
And then again, for clinical and non-clinical, like it's uh, giving the opportunity to celebrate that speak up culture, even if concerns that were raised prove unwarranted. So maybe someone does cuss and ultimately their cuss isn't necessarily, they, they just aren't, are not, they find out that we don't have a shared mental model and that the cuss isn't necessarily um, relevant. It's still saying to that person, you know, Rhonda, thank you so much for speaking up and stating your concern, but I need you to trust me right now because X, Y, and Z, or because I have this piece of information. Um, so it's always celebrating when people do um, speak up. So same goes for the non-clinical environment as well. And so that's just a really high level overview of, again, how we've changed some of our team steps tools or modified them to fit our environment. Um, and again, hopefully you've been able to see the parallels between how, um, if you are clinical, if you are a nurse, or a physician on the call, how this can be used outside of your unit or your department or your direct patient care. And so I wanted to just take a moment, so I've been talking now for a while, um, and have a quick discussion. Um, and so I want you to, if you feel like sharing, raise your hand um, and I can have Kara unmute you. Um, how do you feel like, or that coordination of teamwork and effective communication is critical to the non-clinical work environment in healthcare. And do you have an example? So does anyone have an example of how teamwork and effective communication is critical to the non-clinical work in healthcare? So you can go in and raise your hand or if you feel more comfortable chatting that in. Kara, do I need to give instructions beyond raising their hand? No, you're good. So yeah, no, I see Barbara chatted in, you know, decreased miscommunication. Um, and so miscommunication still occurs in non-clinical work. <laughs> so it's still relevant there. I, when I think of non-clinical work in the healthcare environment, um, for those that are familiar with the Sue Sheridan video, um, she shares a story of how her, both her husband and her son experienced, um, medical errors. And so Similar to what Christy just chatted in, the non-clinical work can have an impact in the clinical work. This was certainly the case where her husband's, um, I believe, um, biopsy results were misfiled um, and miscommunicated. And so they went unread for several months. And so again, that's, I would consider that, that you know, a non-clinical kind of administrative part um, that had a major clinical impact. Right. Let's move on to the next question. Um, how have you successfully employed team steps tools in your non-clinical environment? So for those that have done so in the non-clinical environment, what made it fly? What made it successful? Or what barriers did you face? Again, if anyone wants to come off mute and be brave, you certainly can. Um, and raise your hand or chat it in. We're always looking for new use cases of how the tools can be used non-clinically or success stories, but just wanted, we have a lot of experts on this call, but also wanted to get your feedback here too. So um, someone chatted in, we use briefing and debriefing for our area quality and safety committee. Yep, so everyone's on the same page. Um, so anyone, could support stakeholders who were reporting or presenting. Perfect. The e S I assume the SBAR email format to get attention. Oh, we have someone with their hand up. Kathleen, Kara, if you could unmute her. Okay, am I unmuted? You are okay. unmuted, thanks. Okay. We did a team steps training in a, um, a clinic 
but it was mostly about um, building that team up. You know, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, the clinical care they were giving, mm -hmm. but it was about building the teamwork amongst those providers. It was med assistants and the registration staff and all of that, because mm -hmm. they really weren't, um, they didn't have each other's backs, put it that way, you mm -hmm. know, so we did a full day team steps training with that group. It seemed to be successful for a while. I really hadn't been able to follow up. It's been a few years at this point, but um, I think, um, we found it very beneficial. Sustainability is always the big thing. Yes, yes. And I think that's why um, from our perspective using and really starting using TeamSeps tools non-clinically, again, for your example, Kathleen, you had you know people who were clinical and non-clinical alike. Um, it really helps at least foster that. We do have commonality in the work we do. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, other folks have said, I'm just looking at the chat. So the barriers, um, Heather wrote separate, the barriers I encountered are the fact that I know and have learned team steps as a nurse and am now in a non-clinical department. So yeah, I think it is sometimes hard for folks to translate it, but hopefully with some of the um, use cases here today, um, you can really start to see the parallels between how the tools can be um, can be utilized. And Chrissy said she uses SBAR for escalations and presentations at patient safety subcommittee, and it's been really successful. Yeah, we've also used SBAR um, report outs at meetings. And so we used to have these very painful meetings where people would kind of just, again, word vomit a lot of <laughs> a lot of, uh, uh, of status updates on whatever project they were reporting out on. Um, and so finally we said, oh, we should do this for an SBAR. And so everyone would put their report out into an SBAR and it went much more efficiently um, during our meeting. So that was appreciated by all. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for your input. Um, Really just to hit a few points and then I'll open it up for a couple of questions here. Um, again, hopefully from today, you you recognize the value that, you know, all healthcare, oops, these team members um, should be trained in team steps. So when we think about that triangle at the beginning with the, with the core team all the way to administration, uh, really everyone, I think there's value in, in teaching them non-clinically the, the use cases for team steps and how to apply it. Um, especially for the clinical team members, because it can really help sustain and spread team steps if it's embedded in that environment as well. And then ultimately that really benefits having those team steps courses should be interprofessional, kind of like what Kathleen shared uh, just now with how they've uh, did a bit of training and just uh, level setting of, you know, teamwork, um, you know, within, within that clinic or within that clinic. Um, and so I mentioned that uh, you can access all of these resources. So we have our AHA Team Training Learning Center. Um, Kara can chat that link in. And so we have course materials, so actual slides and facilitation guides for four-hour essentials and two-day Team Steps Master Training. And so again, within those materials, there's clinical and non-clinical uh, examples, activities, everything you saw there is baked into that. So that's kind of our one-stop shop for some training resources for you all. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because I know we have a couple minutes. Are there any questions, any burning questions I can answer at this time? I don't think I've seen anything in the chat. Um, Joseph just chatted me and not everyone, but he asked, are we allowed to use your slides? You certainly can. Um, a lot of the, some of these slides you'll see in the course materials that are on our AHA team training learning center. Um, so, uh, the unofficial slogan of team steps is to steal shamelessly and give generously. So you are more than welcome to steal. Other questions? Okay. 
Okay, I think I will, um, you can always reach out to us at our email address. That's, this will reach our entire team. So I know um, some of you said you hadn't done Team Steps training yet. Some of you said you were looking for some of these resources. So if we haven't met your needs or if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. One of us will get back to you. Um, so I think with that, I will turn it over to Rhonda to just kind of close us out for today. All right, well, thank you, Jen. That was fantastic. Uh, and, you know, really meets a need we've heard from the field over and over again, the, their desire to, to make that crossover with Team Steps tools and concepts into the non-clinical environment and wondering exactly how to do that. So super timely webinar. Thank you so much, Jen. So um, uh, just a few final reminders. Please do complete the evaluation form that will appear on your screen once the webinar ends. It'll pop right up there for you. We really do value your opinions, your comments, suggestions, um, and love your praises as well. So uh, please do fill out that evaluation. Uh, continuing education, again, if you would like a CE credit for today's presentation, you'll need to create a Duke One Link account if you have not done so before. And you can download from those from the files pod or your registration confirmation email. Be sure in text that G-A-N-M-U-N to the number on the screen within 24 hours if you would like CE credits for your attendance today. So other than that, thank you for being with us. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to provide this training for you, our listening audience. And as Jen said, don't hesitate to reach out to us at, at uh, any of the emails on the screen there. If you have further questions, uh, comments, um, or input for us. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks, everyone.